mainly concentrate on, I'm going to guess, is uh, animal fossils here, but uh, I'll kind of go through some uh, time periods here to give you an idea of what's happened in our part of the country. We start to back in dinosaur times. We don't find land dinosaur fossils here in Nebraska, even though everybody wants to find dinosaur fossils. Any big bone they find is a dinosaur, but actually it's probably mammoth that's from around here. Uh, we were underneath an ocean during dinosaur times, so the only place you'll find dinosaur, true dinosaur land fossils, is clear in northeast Nebraska and during the very, very, very last part of the dinosaur time period. So around here we find mostly ocean type uh, fossils uh, from dinosaur times. Uh, shark teeth are fairly common. If you get in the right deposits uh, down around Red Cloud, they find lots of shark teeth. And Mosasaurus is another big animal that was swimming around. The Plesiosaurus, uh, he's got a, a big uh, uh, petrified bone, the Plesiosaurus paddle, in the Cambridge Museum. So we had those kind of guys swimming around here during that uh, uh, ocean time period. Another thing I could uh, mention about the ocean time period is uh, <coughs> that's kind of ties us through Nebraska history here is when this ocean disappeared it left lots of salt deposits uh, behind. That's where Salt Lake comes from out in the Utah. It's isolated from that ocean. But these salt deposits along eastern Nebraska and Kansas and down into Oklahoma became important because uh, millions of years later when the native people came through they wanted salt. They traded salt. Very important commodity. The Bible talks about the salt trade all the time. So this salt here in eastern Nebraska was traded for things clear down to Central and South America. And of course that, that trade network was very well established even though they were still on foot. When the Europeans showed up, all those trade goods the Europeans spread like wildfire here across the country because they already had a vast trade network. So it wasn't guns and horses, it was also steel tools that changed the whole life of the Native Americans. And that trade network was well established from that salt. And this salt here in eastern Nebraska eventually becomes the biggest salt company in the world. Morton Salt Company, sure with an umbrella on the package, was started by Jay Sterling Morton, another part of Nebraska history. He got rich from selling salt, so he was able to go around and replant our trees. We were not a treeless prairie, uh, like everybody thinks we were. We became a treeless prairie, because we weren't a total forest during that time period. And we could, were devastating forests back east, the white people, as they came through. So when they came out here on the prairies, most of our trees were in the rough canyons along the watercourses. They became treeless fairly rapidly, especially when the railroads came through. They cut all our cedar trees down for railroad ties. The cedar trees are just coming back. They're really not taking over, uh, although they are taking over. <laughs> because they're growing on places they didn't used to grow, because they didn't used to grow on the tablelands because of the uh, bison and the prairie fires. But they were in the rough canyons, so the railroads cut all those cedar trees down for railroad ties, and they used up all the other trees for fuel for their railroads uh, for, to run their trains before they switched to coal. So those valleys that where the railroads came through became treeless very rapidly. And so by the time we had cameras out here, we were a treeless prairie. Uh, but it wasn't a, a natural way of things. But anyway, back uh, when this ocean first dries up, then they started finding some big uh, mammals. Nebraska's famous for its large mammal fossils. You can go to museums all over the country and find mammal fossils from Nebraska. In fact, about 90% of the uh, fossils in the Denver Museum are from Nebraska, uh, mammal fossils that they have. Recently they found a deposit, maybe you heard about up in the mountains, uh, where there was a big bog uh, where a bunch of mammal fossils were found and they about uh, quadrupled or a hundred times their fossil collection from the state of Colorado just in that one site because they didn't have very many mammal fossils up there. Um, and I'll explain why we find so many mammal fossils here in Nebraska where we don't find them in other places here in just a little bit. But another idea that gives you how famous our mammal fossils are, a couple of years ago there was a curator from uh, the Museum of Natural History in Florida came up to Nebraska, to Lincoln, to study our mammal collection in Lincoln. She was there for a couple months, 
because she had just been put in charge of the Nebraska collection in the Florida Museum. And it took one curator to uh, go through their collection there in Florida. And of course, the Smithsonian, the Peabody Museums, when those museums were first being established, they all came out to Nebraska to find our fossils that we have out here. And to make it a little more personal, I have a little bit of a story I'll tell you here that uh, up at Lisco, Nebraska, I went up and volunteered on the dig up there. They were digging up, digging up uh, giant uh, camel fossils. And that was from the Smithsonian. The uh, scientists were from the Smithsonian Institute. Well, what happened was they were out here digging because the Smithsonian decided to redo their camel display in that big museum down there. And uh, they wanted to find a new giant camel because they didn't have any good uh, giant camels, and that was going to be the center of a new camel display. So they can research anywhere in the world. The Smithsonian could go anywhere in the world. The best place to find giant camels was out by Lisco, Nebraska. So I was out there volunteering on the last couple of days of the dig, and the, the uh, paleontologist was pretty excited because they were finding enough camel pieces that they thought they could put one giant camel together, even though it might be different animals. So they do that all the time. But anyway, when I was digging, I found a bone about this long, another bone a little shorter, a little shorter, a little shorter, and I found a complete tail of the camel, and he was very excited because that was the only camel, the only tail they found on the dig, and they were going to close the, the dig the next day. So now out of the millions of displays in the Smithsonian Institute, I can go to the giant camel, here's my tail. <laughs> But anyway, we had these warm weather uh, mammals here to begin with. Lots of rhinos. Uh, there's a uh, uh, room in the Nebraska Hall where they have most of their fossils uh, displayed for comparison studies. It's not a place where you can go in publicly. But that room is probably uh, this wide here and about three times this long. And it has three shelves all the way around. It has shelves down the middle, and everything in there is bottom jaws out of rhinos. Just lined up on the shelves all the way around for comparison studies. And that's how many rhinos we have running around here. And of course, if you know about the uh, rhino ash, ash falls up by Royal Nebraska, it's a world-class display. If you haven't ever been there, they built a building over it. And all those rhinos and a lot of horses and stuff were found there very new volcanic ash. It's kind of a Pompeii for rhinos. They were around the watering hole. This eruption in Idaho, I think they said it was 10 many years ago, this cloud came along and buried all these animals in place. So they're leaving, if you don't know anything about it, they're leaving them in place underneath this building. And uh, you can see them digging. And there was a lot of rhinos and a lot of horses from that time period were found there. Uh, very unusual stuff. The preservation is so good that they found a shorebird there, kind of like a large crane, and uh, they dug it out, and the preservation is so good they can find the main tendons still left on their leg bones. Of course, cranes have a, a pretty strong tendons compared to other animals. But they also found in this one, they found the skeleton of a lizard still in the craw of that crane. So that's how good the preservation is down there. If you get a chance, you need to go down there and see them. So we have all those warm weather animals, uh, rhinos, horses, zebras, lions. Amer we even have American lions, some saber-toothed cats during those time periods. A lot of different kinds of uh, mastodons, uh, a few mammoths. Mammals were just kind of coming in during that warm time period. Um, and of course, that all changed the next major climate change after that warm time period, which lasted from about uh, 12 million years ago up to about 5 million years ago. And they find giant uh, land tortoises during that time period. Um, and then the next major climate change is the Ice Age. 
Ice Age uh, started about two million years ago and lasted up to about 10,000 years ago, which is fairly recent in uh, geology times anyway. But, uh, the Ice Age period is when we really started finding some world class stuff here in Nebraska. Lots of different kinds of mastodons, uh, and a couple different kinds of mammoths, uh, and uh, all the more camels and more horses and all those kind of things too. Lots of bison, several different kinds of bison. Our modern bison is the smallest bison that we find here. Um, so we have all these uh, animals out here during the Ice Age, and it's the very last part of the Ice Age then when they start finding the evidence of Native Americans here. And I can fit in a little bit about that too on as far as uh, Native Americans come in into, into this area. It's kind of controversial. They haven't nailed it down yet. Uh, they used to say that about 12,000 years ago is, is a, as early as they could have come into America. But now they're pushing it back. Some people are pushing it clear back to 40,000 years ago because they thought the only time period they could have come in was during the Ice Age when it got warm enough, the ocean level was low enough that it created the land bridge that you all should have learned about back in school that connected Russia and America together. They thought that that valley through the glaciers had to be open for people to come into America. And there was only a couple warm times during the last part of the Ice Age when that happened. Well, now they're starting to think maybe they come into America back along that ice coast line in small boats. And they're working their way into better places to live. And it sounds pretty treacherous venture now in the ocean in small boats with icebergs floating all <coughs> over. The Eskimos still live this lifestyle today. So you know, it's very possible they maybe made special boats, maybe 10 people on the boat that they can camp out underneath and live off the ocean as they travel. And now they're thinking that's why they're finding so many uh, archaeology sites along the coastline in South America that are just as old as the things that we find right here in the middle of North America. It's because the first people that came into America made in the coastal people. They were ocean living off of the ocean. They might have uh, populated the coastal areas uh, first. And so uh, they're coming up with new ideas. The weather extremes are very bad. People were moving around a lot during the uh, uh, Ice Age period uh, because of those low oceans. And you kind of think about it, this may be when a lot of the world was populated uh, originally. It was during that last part of the ocean, or the Ice Age. When that ocean was lower, there was a lot more islands showing up. People might have kind of started island hopping and, uh, and learning how to travel the oceans. And we know now when those Europeans sent out those big uh, sail ships discovering the world, all they discovered was the world was already discovered. There were people everywhere they went. And people were uh, going out on the oceans a lot earlier than they gave credit for originally. It's just Europeans were mapping and recording things better than any other people did. They know now the Polynesians, the Chinese, the Vikings, all very good early ocean travelers that we don't give very much credit to them. So uh, the Indians may have came into America a lot sooner than what they thought. When they did get here, as far as animals go, they found pretty much the same prairie animals that we have today. Bison was the dominant animal. A lot of animals had become extinct, right? At the end of the Ice Age, there's a mass extinction. Just like all the dinosaurs becoming extinct, a lot of animals are disappearing right at the end of the Ice Age. And there's a lot of different theories of why they disappeared at the end of the Ice Age. It might have just been the, the drastic climate change, kind of got global warming compared to the Ice Age. And uh, some people think a lot of it was diseases besides the climate change. And diseases kind of lay dormant during extremely cold weather. You get uh, two main years of cold weather, animals are going to lose resistance to certain diseases. Warms up, those diseases become prevalent again. Things like tuberculosis may have uh, uh, dropped a lot of the population. But it's mainly the large mammals that die, which is part of that mystery. Think that maybe a comet came through and kind of a, a flash, uh, a kind of like atomic bomb flash uh, going across the country because most of it is in northern Europe and in America where that mass extinction happens. 
disease, climate change, maybe the hunting the stragglers, lots of different uh, ideas of why, the, especially the large mammals like the mammoth and the mastodon, the camels and horses that migrated across the land bridge, they originated here, camels and horses, they think, originated here in the Americas, across the land bridge, survived over in Asia, at the end of the Ice Age, they became extinct with most of those other large animals. So those are the kind of fossils we can kind of find here in this area. It's mostly mammal fossils, and this is where we get into a unique thing, why people come to Nebraska to find mammal fossils. Northern Kansas has them, a little bit in Iowa, but really Nebraska is the hot spot for large mammal fossils. And the reason is, at the very end of the Ice Age, well, back up a little bit, I'll go back into the Ice Age, we had so many animals living here because we were just the right distance from the glaciers. Scientists think that there's uh, so much water locked in ice, like I talked about the lower ocean time period, so much water locked in ice there's not much left for evaporation to cause rain. So it's really glacial melt where most of the vegetation grows. The further away from the glaciers you get, the less plant life you have. The less plant life, the less animal life. So all animals are attracted up close to the glaciers. The glaciers are up in South Dakota. So uh, when this ice age ends, that weather changes, animals are dying off, and there's a lot of loose dirt left behind. And before the plants have time to cover, the wind starts to blow. Of course, we don't have wind down here anymore, but it blew back from the ice age. It buries us very deeply here. All these hills we have out here north of town and clear up to where we live, these Lus Hills are wind-blown soil that blew in there after the Ice Age. Sometimes 150, 200, 300 foot deep, all the same color soil. You drove around these country roads through a cut bank in the country road, straight up banks, you have the top soil up here, same buff color of soil all the way down through the bottom. And that's why we got so many fossils here. Because all that soil blew over all these animals that died and it buried them. And that's why. Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, west of here, you walk around on that sandy, rocky soil out there, you're essentially walking on the same soil the dinosaurs used to walk on. They haven't any overburden to preserve these type of mammal fossils we find here. You go north of us, glaciers. They're not going to have any ice age animals living there in the first place. And some of their older fossils were destroyed by the ice from the ice age. You go south of us, no vegetation, less animals, less animals to be buried. So we're just the right spot to find lots and lots of mammal fossils. So I mentioned uh, a lot of different kinds of animals that we might find here. And if you think about back to school, you can kind of classify. I'm not a very good expert on identifying fossils. Uh, there's people at the university can pick up a little hunk of a bone and tell you exactly what animal and what part of the animal it came from. I found a little joint and the gravel about this long and it was a full bone and you got to have the joints the connecting joints on the bone if you just have a hunk of bone you're not going to be able to identify it no matter how how good you are unless you do a DNA thing on it and uh, and if you just have a big hunk of bone without any joints on it it's not worth identifying anyway so there's no need to do any scientific studies on it but this little bone like here took it to the university because it was a nice fossil bone. I was curious about it. it turned out to be the back hawk bone on a little antelope that used to live here. And they knew exactly what it was just by looking at it. And they're very good at identifying stuff. It's another thing to mention too. In Nebraska, we have a very good working relationship with the professional people. Some states have strict laws that anything you find is cultural resources belongs to the state, no matter whose land it was found on. In Nebraska, the resources belong to the landowner. So the landowner has to say about what's found on their land. The university is very good if they find something that's a very good uh, fossil. If it's a deposit of fossils, they'll work with the landowner. They won't do a dig unless they get what they find, which is natural. So they work with the landowner. Sometimes you should find something important, and you've already found it, and you take it to be identified. If it's important enough, they'll 
ask maybe if you want to donate it. They'll see if you maybe want to have make a cast of it, and they'll give you a cast and keep the original. You know, they, they'll work with you anyway, so they're not going to confiscate anything you take down there. They want to know about it. It's a big country. It's, it's the amateurs that tell them what's going on. Have enough uh, professional people to cover everything that's happening. So if somebody picks <coughs> something up, they're more than happy to know about it. When I'm talking about bones and fossils and stuff, preserving them is very important too, because sometimes you dig things up, you get them out exposed to the air and the sun, and pretty soon you have a pile of bone dust. Uh, so preserving bones is very important. If you got to dry them out, you can't preserve them while they're still wet. If they happen to be in a wet environment find them. Sometimes they're well preserved because they are so wet. That's the problem we're having with that new site up in the mountains in Colorado because they were all buried in a, a bog and how to dry them without them splitting before they get completely dry is a problem. So they're doing a very slow uh, uh, climate control drying process because they can't preserve them when there's still moisture in there and in the process of drying they start cracking and stuff. So won't see probably any of those bones on display that aren't in a climate control uh, for several years out there until they can uh, figure out how to get them preserved. So anytime it's in a wet environment, it's a problem to preserve those bones and get them uh, in a displayable and a permanent uh, state where they can be displayed and preserved. But as far as amateurs go, preserving these bones, one of the best things you can do uh, they do have special hardeners that the university uses and stuff. But what I use is this, this is exterior, interior, exterior wood glue by uh, Elmer's glue. Uh, you water this down about 15 or 20 water parts to one part of glue. So it's just water basically. Paint it on there, let it soak. Paint it on there, let it soak. Paint it on there, let it soak for a month, 20 different times or so. Just keep that so it glues it together from the inside out. That's what you're trying to do. And, uh, and eventually it'll get uh, built up enough. You can tell when it starts building up that it gets to enough to the outside of the bone that you have completely preserved. So uh, drying and preserving bones is very important to if you got something that's nice and it's got a joint on it, some of the things you have that are just uh, parts of leg bones and stuff over here, uh, they're nice uh, to have, but it's very hard to uh, identify them. Uh, big hunks. I'll walk around here a bit. <laughs> big hunks like this are so big, they've got so much. Uh, Volume inside of the uh, <coughs> mammoth. It's the only thing we have this big uh, that can have this big of a leg. A lot of rhinos will have something that's a little bit uh, uh, smaller than this. But the inside of the, the uh, cavity where all the bone mineral is and stuff is uh, the size of that can determine if it's mammoth or not. And this has got enough weight to it that's heavy. You can tell. Uh, and it's old by the way, usually uh, a lot of times when bones are bleached out uh, and they don't have much more weight than the natural weight to the bone. This is another heavy one. You can tell it's kind of polished. Uh, it's pretty old. And of course, some are always filled with dirt too from our most soil that blows all the time. Uh, so basically, a lot of people want to know what's old and what's new. I tell the same thing with artifacts as far as uh, a lot of people make uh, uh, replicas and uh, artifacts and try to pass them off as being uh, uh, old ones. I, you make the comparison of a brand new dollar bill with an old dollar bill. Everybody knows a new dollar bill, it's crisp, it's new. If it feels crisp, if the edges are sharp, it's probably new. It's the same way with the bone. It might be completely bleached out. But if it doesn't have any weight to it, it's probably not very old. So you can just kind of think, comparison, new, old. Uh, and you can tell newer things because they look newer. And some people that may try to pull the wool over people's eyes and stuff, 
they have a way of aging things and stuff. Uh, one way that they can age it, uh, and it takes quite a while though, is put it in manure. They acid in the manure will uh, kind of make it look like it's aged uh, over, over a period of time, about uh, two years or so. It takes uh, that to make it look like it's 10,000 years old. It's so good. But they're going through a process to do that, so most people don't uh, try to make anything that's uh, as far as trying to fool people goes anyway. But as far as identifying what animals and what fossils you're finding, uh, it's a lot of just thinking about those certain animals. Of course, you got all the classifications of animals, just you got to go back to school time to think about the different classifications. You got carnivores and herbivores and uh, Omnivores and insectivores, uh, they're all going to have different kinds of teeth, and that's one of the easiest things to identify is the teeth. Uh, when you've got herbivores, you got two classifications you got browsers and you got grazers. Browsers eat rough vegetation, leaves, uh, roots, bark, and things like that. They're kind of like a, a hog does to uh, uh, rhinos and stuff like that. Grazers, uh, grass eaters, so they're going to have two different types of teeth among the herbivores. And you can also think about just kind of what the animal is. If it's an antelope or a deer or something, they're kind of light and they're fleet-footed, their bones are going to be light and kind of uh, uh, not so dense. We have, a, I mentioned horses, we have about lots of Ice Age horses. You think of horses, you think of stout. They're stout, they're strong. Well, they're one of the few bones that don't really don't have a flare on their joints. Their joint is about the same size as the bone. So when you find horse, it's going to be more uh, just a straight bone like that. Again, you can tell the density. This one here is, is almost uh, it's fossilized. The difference between fossilized and petrified, nobody knows. <laughs> Except petrified is completely replaced. The minerals have been completely replaced. Or the, bone has been completely replaced with minerals, so it's turned completely into rock. Fossilization is just that process, not completely petrified. Nobody knows why some things are petrified and some places they're just fossilized. You can have fossils that are older than petrified bones, so it's not just an age thing and they haven't really figured out what's going on. But these are two Ice Age horse bones, if you pass those around, you can kind of feel the old and the heavy, uh, to know that it's just a modern horse. You get the same thing with their teeth. You have square blocky teeth. Horses, especially their molars, not the, the ones that they put the grass off with. So horses, horses are the same type of thing. It's just more heavy and blocky. What part of the horse? Those are the uh, femurs, the uh, just above where the hoof, okay. where the foot. This is where the foot starts. <coughs> now that's another thing you can do too with a, with a split hoof animals and uh, hoofed animals. Their toes aren't toes; their, toes, their bones are there, but they just come into two. And a lot of times uh, they'll have the dew plums up on their legs, so they have. Toes. So if you get into a place where you, this is coming into two, but in the case of a horse, it turns into a solid hoof instead of a split hoof, which, um, so you can tell that's where the, the toe joint starts. It's where the, uh, this is a metatarsal, I guess is what you call it, um, where the toe starts coming out of that. So you get into a hoofed animals, either split hoof or solid hoof animals when you find this in the metatarsal because that's where the toes start. So when we're on that subject, these are a different horse uh, leg bones from uh, different time periods and they always thought this was a very good way to display evolution. The horse is the best evidence they had of evolution. Because they start out with small horses, 
They have very long dew claws and they have a split hoof. Eventually they lose those dew claws and it becomes a solid hoof. So they lined up these five species of horses as a very good example of evolution. But guess what? Back to Royal Nebraska, the Ash Farm, they find all five of those horses living together at the same time. So that blew that evolutionary theory all to pieces. So when they talk about theories, you want to remember theories are theories. It doesn't necessarily mean they're proved. It's just like the global warming theory. It's a theory. So uh, sometimes it's, uh, they get disproved uh, pretty prominently, like these horses did, uh, through that ash fall. And on the back side of this, there's a picture of ash falls uh, where all those rhinos and horses are very volcanic ash. One thing we have a lot of trouble with around here is the comparison of bison bones and cow bones. If you're finding bison or cow bones. Well, jaw bones are pretty, uh, pretty prominent. The bottom jaw is one of the most common of fossils you'll find because it gets separated from the skull very easily because of the way it's attached up here. And for some reason, they last quite a bit. The teeth last quite a bit. And so you'll find those bottom jaw teeth. One way you can tell with bison from cows is that they got the grazing uh, teeth. But if you look down at this right here between the teeth, on both of these samples here, you see that there's an extra little bone down there that kind of looks like a little straw. Cows don't have that. So if you can get the teeth, if you're finding cow bones, and you can get the teeth out of the cow bones, um, and find out whether that double extra straw is just a little bitty thing right here. You can see this has one on each, each one of them. Sometimes it's not as prominent, but you will have that extra little straw going down between the ridge of the teeth. And you'll know it's bison and the cows too. You just get one, you just get one of those. I'm not sure that's what you want to ask. These are split like cowboys. Yeah, that's what I say. They, left, they lost the split because on the evolutionary theory, they, they lost the uh, dew claws and they lost the split hoof and became a solid hoof. But they didn't lose it because they rolled it in the same time. So yeah, at one time horses had a split hoof and that's why you see that on their, on their metatarsal their, uh, where their toes come out because it was split into two, two like split up like a deer or an elk and now they're solid hooves. So these are the bison teeth here with that extra little straw down right here. And right here. Well, it's just on one side of the tree. Or is that extra piece of meat or do the way it was? So you don't have to, the grass don't get caught in your teeth so bad, so you don't have to brush it off. <laughs> this is a part of a camel jaw bone here. You can see the ridges here where they're cutting grass. So teeth are very important as far as identifying things. So in this display case here, you have lots and lots of different mammoth teeth. These are all mammoth teeth down here, different sizes. Mammoths and mastodons go through five or six sets of teeth as they're growing up. So they're replacing their teeth, they're wearing them down because they're eating the rough teeth. The, the difference between a mastodon and a mammoth should have brought some better examples of this that I could get out instead of those that are all locked back behind there. But a mammoth is a grazer. He eats grass. So he has a plated tooth. This is an unk. A lot of times they come apart just like this and has it, those plates. So you can see all these plated teeth down here. The chewing surface is a flat part up above there for grinding up grass. 
but mammoths aren't just eating any grass. They got to eat a lot of grass. So they're specialized in eating slough grass, wetland grass. We don't have anything alive except for beavers and uh, muskrats that are able to chew up coarse wetland grass. And they have that same plated mower player in the back of their mouth. But of course, a beaver and a mouth, uh, muskrat is going to have a very big tooth compared to a mammoth. So the mammoth is the only grazing animal that has these plated teeth. So this hunk of jawbone here has to be mammoth. Because you can see where the tooth was sitting. I have a tooth. That's okay. Mammoth. Yeah, like right, that. right. So anytime you have a plated tooth that's bigger than a beaver's tooth, <laughs> here, well, there were some giant beavers back then, too. You're going to have a mammoth. It's the only one that has these plated teeth like that. You can see all those plated teeth. Some of them were broken at the plates, just like this one here. Uh, with this little hunk of jawbone, ordinarily this is not enough to identify when the animal it came from. This is not a very big hunk of jawbone, but it has to be mammoth because it had a plated tooth embedded in it. Now the mastodon, the other animal, has a dome tooth because he's a browser rather than a grazer. So Mastodon is uh, massacring trees, knocking them over, eating the, the smaller branches and the leaves. Maybe even uh, if they can get a tree and a bush tipped over, they can eat the roots, all those rougher parts of the plant rather than eating grass. But the word Mastodon, Don is a Greek word that means tooth. Uh, you go to an orthodontist. So Mastodon has a massive dome tooth. This is really wore down bad, uh, this piece of it. But you can see it's a rougher, it's kind of like our molar. That's what a Mastodon's tooth looked like. A mammoth's tooth, I always say Mastodon has a dome tooth. Mammoth has a smooth, mammoth has a smooth tooth. So you can tell the difference in any of those two kind of animals. Now there's lots and lots of different kinds of Mastodons. There's only a few different kinds of mammoths. So mastodons go back further. I mentioned earlier the mammoths do. They go clear back. And, uh, and the mastodons, some of them have four teeth, or four tusks, I mean. There's a four tusker, there's a shovel tusker, uh, and there's a prong tusker. All sorts of different tusks the mastodons had. Uh, mammoths have only had the two tusks. And tusks are actually modified teeth they have to have blood and nerves going to them, so there's all, all these all hollow plates that are going down through the tusk until you get down to the last so far of it, and it'll be solid. It has to have those blood and nerves going down inside the tusk. So the tusks are always hollow inside. But uh, mastodons, and the, the tusk is ivory, of course. Our teeth are, are enamel, but ivory and enamel are very closely related. In fact, I've got a little piece of wood, a wood rod of the little piece of tusk that's only about this long. It's very hard to identify what animal that piece of tusk came from, but I know it came from a four tusk or mastodon because it's the only tusk that on the bottom of it it's got a strip about this way that's enamel, and the rest of it is ivory. So that's the process of changing and uh, developing from a tooth into a tusk. Uh, it's got enamel and ivory on both on the same thing. There is a hunk of tusk or uh, tusk over here. It's pretty much petrified, it's pretty much turned into rock. So it's hard to tell whether this, uh, some people think, is a piece of a tree. Uh, one way you can tell, uh, it's pretty hard if it's been tumbled in water and smoothed out. But if you don't know whether you're finding a piece of bone or a piece of uh, rock, touch it to your tongue and it will feel like Velcro on the tip of your tongue because bones are porous. If you touch Velcro, it will stick. <coughs> it won't be smooth. <coughs> yeah. It's a hunk of tusk, yeah. So even, even this part of the bone that looks smooth here, well, if you touch it with your tongue, it'll kind of stick to your tongue. Um, 
the bone that doesn't feel completely smooth, but of course the reason it's sticking is because of the porousness of the bone. But even uh, sometimes it's hard to tell whether you're looking at a piece of bone or a piece of, of uh, rock. Even this part of the bone right here will have that uh, stick when you touch it. These are the three main different kinds of bison that they've had back through prehistory. This top one, I've seen that back in the back room. I can't reach and touch the tips of those uh, tusks or horns on there. That's another thing I can tell you too about. You got to think about with those grazing animals. If you find part of a skull, you can think about the difference between horns and antlers. You got a pretty good example of that over here. You know, okay, with skull, of course, you got the big horn sheep here that everybody can tell. They have horns, which means they have a bone inside of their horn. The horn itself is actually, if you look at the casing of a horn, it's actually matted together hair. You can actually see in the horn core it comes off, and it's just pieces of hair. So it has to have blood. It grows all the time. Uh, it's alive. So that horn core is, is being fed by the bone that's inside of it. And of course, uh, antlers are shed every year. It's one of the fastest growing uh, things there is as far as in the animal kingdom because they grow those massive antlers like in yeah. caribou and, and elk and stuff. Besides deer growing on one year. Well, this is, this is an antler animal rather than a horn animal because the horn sheds off every year and you can actually see this was probably in the very very early spring when this guy died because he's lost one horn and he's still got the base of the other horn still attached so he hasn't lost the other horn to grow another so this is probably caribou or something like that it's uh, too massive of a horn to be or of an antler rather everybody gets always talked the same way Maybe it's said the difference between hornets and antlers had interchanged. If this guy was an antler, and the base of the antler is too massive to be any deer, so it's got to be elk or caribou, but I would guess it's from the caribou. We had a lot of caribou uh, during that ice age period down this far, too, because they couldn't go any further north. So I don't know if you've seen this magazine, some of you have it at home and stuff, it's an older magazine, it's out of print right now, uh, but it's very good going through all those time periods, all those fossils and into the artifacts, it's very neat uh, uh, book, and we still have it available in our gift shop too, if anybody interested in getting it, I even brought a few copy, extra copies if somebody wants to get it, it goes through all those different things. One thing that's very interesting, one of the most interesting, there's my giant cat. Uh, very interesting to me, very unusual, something that was found here. I don't know if you found those two, or heard about those two <coughs> mammoths that were entangled together and fought to the death. They're up at, uh, in the museum up to Fort Robb right now. They put a big display of them. They were tangled together. And they cast them out that way, and they had them for years in the back room in the museum. I don't always see them in the back room, but they finally got them out and on display at the Fort Robinson Museum up there. But one of the neat things they found is that underneath one of those mammoths, when it fell over, it smashed the coyote. This is a smashed coyote skull, and this is a new modern coyote skull, just for comparison. But they think it was very slick when those guys were fighting each other, and that's why they they, uh, they got tangled together because they they each lost broke off a tusk on the opposite side of their heads. So when they they were able to get real close to each other, and their tusks got locked together with the stub that was still left. The whole the whole tusk on one was locked with the stub on the other one, and they got locked together and fell over and smashed the coyote. 
and it had to happen when the coyote was still alive because otherwise it would have broke to smithereens. And so it was still a living coyote when the skull got scuffed and smashed. So we find all sorts of meat. <clears throat> One thing I tell people up at our place when they come up, uh, we have four ma or 14 major tie specimens that were found right there on the Metis Creek Valley. A tie specimen is when the scientist finds the very first of its kind anywhere in the world, they get the honor of giving them an scientific name. So 14 major tie specimens have been found up in our uh, area of the Medicine Creek from the lake on up. Um, and that's big tie specimens. I don't count them, just a little mice and gophers sized animals that have been found there. And that's just another example of what world class stuff we're able to find in this area. But it's very it's preserved. That's what preserves it is because it's buried so good. So you need to kind of keep track of those things. Uh, when you find something in a gravel deposit, it's probably pretty old. Um, and even nowadays, you can, uh, along the Republican River here, you can go out when the river's down and find a lot of Ice Age teeth from bison and horses. And if you're out there walking when the water's down, look around the sandbars where the gravel's a little bit bigger because the water kind of sorts things by weight. So uh, you know, the bigger, uh, pieces of teeth and bones and stuff will be in that larger gravel deposits. So you can still walk the river and find the ice age uh, teeth especially nowadays. So I can, I don't know what else I have over here that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> one thing I was going to tell you too is uh, you can tell this is a hip socket here but you can tell an immature animal from a mature animal because their bones when you, when you become mature your bones all grow together the dice when it's still young those eggs, these have smooth plate bones you all know about vertebrae how they sit together well, they sit together where they don't wear on each other, so they have a nice plate on each side. Well, this is an immature one because that plate has come loose. So this has to be mammoth because there isn't anything this big when it's still immature. socket. Again, you got a lot of weight here. This is that hip socket that goes into the pelvic bone and you can see where it's come loose. So this is probably immature mammoth uh, because a mastodon, when it's mature, is going to have about this same size of a hip socket. But since it come off, it means this is still growing so it's going to get bigger. questions about anything. I don't know what else I was going to talk about here that I saw in your stuff. Yeah, it's old. It's yeah, an extra weight on it for that size of a bone. Yeah. Now those two are the ones you say don't go together. Yeah, because they don't, they don't 
that you'll be more intrepid than you are now if, you're, if your head didn't fit any better than that. <laughs> They were found in the same location, so they put the... Yeah, together. yeah, it needs to go down in there with a smooth <coughs> rotation, yeah. But it's mammoth. Both of them have to be mammoth. I don't know that I saw anything in this case that probably, yeah, probably isn't mammoth, except maybe that leg bone might be right on instead of mammoth. Uh, well, it's hard to tell. Tusks are difficult to. Uh, I would say that's mammoth because of the curvature of it. Most mastodons have straighter tusks. So, but if you just got a small tusk or a piece of a tusk, it's hard to tell. But with that much curve there, I would think it had to be mammoth rather than mastodon. Well, I don't know what's, I didn't even read it, no, it says, yeah, it says Mastodon. That tip is supposed to be off of this and this, isn't it? Off the same one? The tip of it? Yeah. Well, if you found that tip, by itself, which I don't know whether it was or not, it would be hard to identify. But if it was off of this that long one here, it's probably mastodon rather than or mammoth rather than mastodon. Yeah, but I think the way I read it earlier that it's. See, this is a four tusker mastodon here. I don't know how I opened that up right to the right page. But you can see their, their tusk aren't as curved. It's more of a channel curve. It's not. I mean, this is almost like the outside of a wheel there. So this four tusker, his bottom tusk will have that same strip right along the bottom of that tusk that I talked about. That's the strip of the enamel on the bottom tusk. That's the only master picture of a mastodon they have in there. Now well, there's the shovel tusk. The jawbone. This picture, this jawbone over here with the great round in the picture, uh, that's the they think is the largest jawbone of any land animal that's ever lived any time, any place, anywhere in the world. Wow. Even bigger than dinosaur jawbones. I don't count the tusk, just the jawbone. And that was found on that Yeah, largest jawbone of any animal that's ever lived. And we've got one of those four tuskers, uh, or the shovel tusk jawbones up at our place in the Army Museum that Henry Cole found there. He didn't find it, but the county found it digging a gravel out of his gravel. So again, it went to Henry Coe instead of the county because it was from the land. So it's on loan in the markets. And I had to put it together because the county wasn't very good at digging it out with the, uh, the pay loader. You know, it's not too easy to dig fossils with pay loaders. <laughs> not recommended. <laughs> through a program style deal like I just did here where we go through all the different time periods and talk and stuff. And people find that we pass things around uh, too, which everybody enjoys, not just the kids handling things. It's always neat when you can handle things you remember about things better and stuff. I had a guy up there once that uh, said he was a museum buff. He came on a bus tour. He said, I've probably been to the best 10 museums in the country. He said, I've learned more in your museum in a half hour than I've learned in all those other museums together. Because I talk, and you, know, you go in a museum and you read signs, and pretty soon, what did that sign 10 signs ago say? 
don't remember that. Like when somebody tells you when you pass things around, it kind of sinks in for me. Let's get in your hand. Fourteen. <laughs> 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 
Okay, good. Really good. Is this rocks or air vents